Our gospel today comes to us from the second chapter of John. Glory to you, O Lord. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And so they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, even though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from our triune God. Amen. I was talking with Christopher Haid about a week and a half ago about a friend of his named Matt who recently died from cancer, much, much too young. This was the kind of friend that goes back decades, the kind of friend that you were friends with like way back when you were younger and cooler. It's the kind of friend that you've taken vacations with and you know each other's kids kind of friend that you still keep in touch with, even when one of your families moves all the way across the country. This was the kind of friend for Christopher that also knew him well enough that when Chris said that he felt like he wanted to get to know himself better, this friend Matt encouraged him to get in touch with his emotions. Eventually, Matt encouraged Chris to get um, involved in a program that he was part of called Mankind, as in kindness, where guys come together to talk about the stuff that they're feeling and going through. Chris did. After some time, he got involved with this group, and this organization had a particularly profound impact on Christopher and continues to to this day. Now and again, we come across these special people who help us to grow in a way that we never could have imagined. Maybe somebody asked you a perfectly timed question or invites you to join a project like this friend Matt did for Chris. Maybe it's someone who hired you for a new job because they saw potential in you, or it was someone who convinced you to go on a second date with the person and see what happened. For Jesus, one of these people was his mother. Once upon a time, Jesus was at a family wedding when disaster struck because they were almost out of wine at the party. There in the back area where I imagine the hosts running around and trying to figure out what to do, Jesus' mother pulls him aside for a conversation. I wonder if the dots were kind of connecting in her head as she saw stuff unfolding and she knew what happened or knew what needed to happen in order to save this party. Whatever she's thinking, all she does is state the obvious to Jesus when she says, there is no wine. And it seems like Jesus picks up on her intention. But for some reason, he's a little hesitant to pull off his mother's request. Maybe Jesus wants to just hang out with the cousins and keep a low profile at the wedding. And he's just been baptized by, by God and claimed by God, baptized by John and claimed by God, but he hasn't really done anything very son of God-like yet at this point in his life. And from the way that he responds to his mom, it seems like he's not real interested in, in doing something fancy or impressive at the wedding that night. Maybe Jesus wants his first miracle to be snazzier, more fire and lightning or something like that. Maybe Jesus is feeling edgy and wants to do something more provocative than providing a bunch of delicious wine for a lot of people that have already drank a lot that night. What an extravagance. Maybe he brushes off his ma because he's kind of worried about opening the miracle floodgates. Can you imagine what will happen when this news hits the street that we got the Son of God working miracles over there? Whatever his deal was at this party, he tells his mother that his time has not yet come. His mom seems to kind of roll with it, and I don't doubt that she knew her kid well, knew his gifts. 
And I'm betting that the Spirit of God also knew that despite the resistance that Jesus felt, that he was going to go through with it and follow through on Mary's unspoken request. Does Mary squeeze his, his hand or hug him as she leaves? I don't know. All she does is tell the servants to do what he says and then she leaves. I wonder as I read this story, if Jesus' future in that moment, that night at the wedding, if his future was just a little too much for him to step into on his own. I wonder if in the midst of all of the noise of getting baptized recently and daily living, I wonder if God's voice was just a little hard for him to hear. I wonder if the call on Jesus' life at that point, which was huge, if that call was just a little too much for Jesus to get his arms around on his own. And by the grace of God, Jesus is, is standing there and he's face to face with one of the people in his life who knows him better than almost anyone. His mother knew him. She believed in him. She saw what he could do. She saw what this world could be and buoyed by her deep love for him and faith in him. Jesus, son of God, turned six huge stone jars of water into excessively delicious wine. Now and again in, in our life, we stumble across those people who either believe in us or believe in this world so deeply that they seem to take us to another level. Maybe we don't personally know them, but they've written a piece of music or they have written something that we've read that loves us and pulls us onto another space in, in our journey. Sometimes it's a person that we, well, uh, that we know well, like Chris's friend, Matt, and they challenge us or they tell the truth to us in some way that it inspires us to live into our God-given potential. Sometimes they are dear, dear people to us. And as we face great struggles, there they are with us, loving us forward into whatever mess is surrounding us at that particular moment. Who is it that has loved you into a new way of being? Who has called you through the things that they've said to grow into another space, to move into another space where God is calling us? About 12 years ago, when I started this, my long road towards ordination, I, I had a Mary of sorts in my own life, and her name was uh, Jeannie Adams. Jeannie had been a pastor's wife, a teacher, a licensed counselor, and then in her retirement, she volunteered much of her time counseling staff that served homeless women with children. Jeannie was also a wise woman who knew much about the church, and about people. And over the course of several years, she became a trusted friend, a mentor, someone who I look forward to seeing at church. Little did I know then, but Jeannie Adams saw things in me that I couldn't see in myself. One day when I, I told her that I was, I truly felt called to ministry, but I couldn't see myself as a pastor being a gay man in a clerical culture where that was still not welcomed, Jeannie made a point to invite me to lunch. Over several months and, and more than a few lunches, Jeannie and I met. And during our time together, she would skillfully ask questions that had me telling my story. Stories about my family growing up and my chosen family. Stories about my years of service to the church as a music minister, my nonprofit work and volunteer efforts. And in those stories, I began to see, together with Jeannie, how God had been calling me and using me as a pastoral presence all along. Well, those experiences and, and, and Jeannie's wise advice along the way have gotten me through more than a few roadblocks. But more importantly, over time, they have strengthened my faith, allowed me to trust more and to live into what God has called me to be. You know, there's many people, I think, in our lives that do that every day. We just don't take note of it. Sometimes we do, and, and I think when those special moments come up, they don't leave our memory. And I know in two instances I can reflect back. Um, the one that, that really turned, turned things for me in terms of, of um, my always wanting to be an artist. I grew up, always wanted to do something in the arts, and I pursued so many different things, and 
didn't have the training. And so when I finally found myself after high school taking an art class, I was in a room of very talented young people. At least I felt more talented than I. And as hard as I tried, I just felt I couldn't do it. I, it was a life drawing class and it was drawing in a nude body. And while I had done a lot of things in grammar school and throughout high school, this really knocked me for a loop. It was a moment where I, I saw I could not um, really grasp the concept of drawing the human body. And I was so discouraged. Uh, this was after several classes that I started to pack my things up. I was in class. I started to pack my art stuff up and uh, I felt a hand on my shoulder and it was my instructor. And he asked me where I was going and I said, I just can't do this. And he said, stop right there. I don't remember the exact words, but he convinced me to stay and try again. And I did. And at that moment, I think I felt something, wow, he, he saw I have an ability to do this. And somehow it clicked. I was able to concentrate and focus. And um, I realized in those days after that I did have a talent that just needed some training and some discipline. And I've been carrying the creative side of me throughout everything I've done in my life. I'm not the best artist, but I'm an encouraged artist. I'm a supported artist. And this instructor, I always think of him whenever I'm challenged with a new media or a new creative project, or maybe I'm feeling not creative enough, that hand on my shoulder in that moment, um, that has always stayed with me. I also was blessed with, um, as I started my 43 years at DePaul University, I was blessed with an enormously talented and, and, and very compassionate uh, boss, Elaine. I call her mom to this day. She saw in me leadership capabilities that I always had, but I didn't realize that I had them. And it's very humbling when someone sees something in you that you maybe thought you had, but not in the way they see it. And there was a lot of trust and a lot of growth <clears throat> and a lot of commitment in understanding that. And so that leadership skill that God gave me is something that I have to, to take with humility and grace and use it in the right way. So when I was in high school, I decided to audition to be a drum major my junior year, who was the person that stands in front of the marching band and conducts them during the halftime show. And as part of the audition process, each of the drum major candidates was supposed to take the band out into the parking lot, put them in parade formation, and have them march around, giving them a few different orders. So each of the other candidates went one by one before me and was given some sort of starting indication by the band director. But when it became my turn, the band director had gotten caught up in conversation with somebody else. And so the band was kind of standing around, milling about in conversation. I'm waiting there for the band director to finish his conversation. And eventually I, I turned to one of the assistant band directors and said, should I just go or... And he looked me dead in the eye and said, I don't know, you tell me. And that was, that was the level up challenge right there. Um, the challenge was to stop waiting for someone else to give me permission and to start giving permission to myself. And I've tried to live by that since then. Thanks, Emily, Jessica, and Christopher for sharing your stories with us. Stories like yours help us to reflect on our own lives and think about who are the people who have helped us to grow into new spaces and who have seen how we have the possibility to, to bless this world or seen that there is a way through this mess that we are going through. Helped us to move more uh, beyond where we are right now. Oh, thank you for sharing your stories with us. You share with us and that helps us to reflect on what God's presence looks like when it is alive in our lives. Sometimes we do this for um, other people. Sometimes people call us into being. Sometimes we do this for others. It also happens when congregations grow into new spaces, much as we as a congregation can't help but do as we grow into a new space with all this pandemic stuff that is going on around us. 
Sometimes the process of growing and leveling up or moving into a new space isn't easy, especially when stuff is changing so much around us right now and there's so much uncertainty, it's hard to see exactly where it is we're going. By the grace of God, I do see us transforming as people, as a congregation, as a society into something new. As activists and truth tellers call us to transform, I see us deepening into new spaces as we offer radical compassion to hurting people. I see God working on us one heart at a time. God has always been in the business of enlivening our imaginations, helping us to think about what else could be. God's always been in the business of rolling stones away from the tombs of our lives. God's always been in the business of calling us into the uncharted territories of our hearts. Blessed be the journey. Amen.